the spook happening tober horror fest thing ends today because there's a man behind you with a pair of giant scissors waiting to snap off your head. Oh, it's because it's the last Friday of the month. And what better way to end this creatively bankrupt series of horror themed episodes in October than with a game that I really, really treasure. In the sense that it creeps me the hell out and I've never finished it because of that. This, my friends, my acquaintances, my people in the comments who will sometimes wonder why I didn't put Outlast in the top 7 best horror games show made in 2010. This is Clock Tower. What you're seeing in the background is the Windows most the Windows 95 version. I finally found that it. it's well, you know, you know. It technically it wasn't released outside of Japan, so the translation was made by some fans. I think uh, from the Don't Cry Jennifer forum or something, because there is no official release outside of Japan for it. And uh, don't let the cursor fool you. The game was never meant as a PC title. Clock Tower was released in the year 1995 for the Super Famicom or the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It was made by a studio called Human Entertainment that made a bunch of other titles. I mean a whole bunch and bunch of other titles. Not to be confused with Human Head Entertainment which is a different company that made very 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 different games. Human Entertainment was shut down I think 18 years ago but it did manage to make quite a handful of titles. Very interesting ones like Clock Tower. Since the original version was made for the SNES you may be wondering why is the PC version pointing and click. Well, they all were. And it wasn't made because you could play it with a Famicom mouse, no, it was meant for you to play it with a D-pad. Clock Tower is purposefully slow. It is a game that will make you sit through all the walking slowly upstairs animations, through all the door opening animations, through all the goes into the foreground, comes back into the background, actually it's the other way around animations. All the while you're moving that cursor with the d-pad slowly, slowly, slowly inching your way to the thing that may grant you freedom or demise. You could call this a point-and-click adventure horror game. This is not a survival horror type of affair because it lacks one of the fundamental principles of survival horror, that being that you have to manage some resources that will ensure your survival. You know, things like ammunition, health pickups, or finding better guns. This was one of the founding principles of the genre set up by Project Firestart, continued by Alone in the Dark, and then we use in every other game in the genre. That's why I wouldn't say that Clock Tower is necessarily a survival horror, it is a horror game. One well, one technically in which your goal is that of survival, but more through the means and mechanics of adventure games. So I guess that, that still makes the survival horror, just not an action survival horror. So forget what I said earlier. What this game really excels at is crafting the perfect protagonist for this kind of game. You know what always takes me off about most survival horror games? You're playing as somebody armed with a gun that could shoot the enemy. Alone in the Dark did it kinda okay. You could shoot the enemy, but the enemy would always come back. And a lot of the enemy, you couldn't kill it. Project Firestart, you had really not all that many options in terms of shooting the enemy because there were a lot of them and you would probably die. And then the Resident Evil era came when you could shoot down hordes of monsters and it sort of started to dwindle. The horror element started to dwindle to the point where Dead Space came out and you were armed with weapons designed to tear apart planets and somehow a bunch of 
weirdos thought they could have a chance with stopping. Well, there was that one thing that was invincible in the second game, and that was really actually terrifying. But the rest, um, they were cannon fodder. You can't generate fear if you put somebody well armed against cannon fodder. What you can do to generate fear is that you make a protagonist like Jennifer Simpson. She's a teenager, she's an orphan, she and her friends are taken to a mansion where the owner of the mansion supposedly wants to adopt them. Their caretaker goes off to find that owner, never comes back. They're all standing in a room. Jennifer says to herself, okay, I'm gonna... I'm gonna go while she, one of the other ones, tells her to. She goes to find the caretaker and uh, she hears a scream. And when she comes back, they're all gone. And there's just silence. And the sound of your feet as they on the wooden floor. This is the same thing that Alone in the Dark did and it does it for the same reason, to add tension, because you just know that if something else is out there, it's gonna make its own. Or just like in Alone in the Dark, it'll be accompanied by its own musical sting, in this case a tune that is somewhat reminiscent of John Carpenter's theme for Halloween. Quite fortuitous since it's getting close to Halloween. Also the movie came out, the, the, the sequel to the first. There's a... Cr never mind. I should prefix by saying that you may have seen an intro at the beginning. That was from the Windows 95 version. It's a horrible... it's... My, uh, yeah. That is one of the worst intros I've ever seen. This was made in 95, people. This was made in an age when uh, maybe CGI intros were not the best. Well, they could have done it in Warcraft style, but they went for the realism and that didn't work out. Also, the, the intro kind of just spoils the whole experience of finding out what's going on. The PlayStation version has a different intro. I mean, the PlayStation remake of this. There's also a sequel on the PlayStation, also called Clock Tower, not with a one or two or anything at the end. It's just Clock Tower because they renamed this one to Clock Tower the First Fear or something. But anyway, the reason why Clock Tower works as a great horror game is that Jennifer is helpless. She is powerless. She has no special abilities. She has no weapons at her disposal. She cannot punch a hole through a wall. She cannot drop kick a zombie in the face five times a minute. She is in full-on panic mode. She will die because she gets just too stressed out by what's happening around her. She can be killed by a parrot if she's already wounded and doesn't escape. She can get killed by a bunch of insects. She will get killed by looking into a mirror. And then there's the serial killer running around. Scissor man, they call him. This is not what you would call an intimidating enemy if you look at the size of this creature. It looks like Joe Pesci if he had a really bad day and wound up in a washing machine and got shrunk down along with his clothes it got shrunk down even more but he does have a giant pair of scissors or hedge clippers scissors probably because he's called the scissor man and with them he can totally murder you and all of your friends which you see the first thing that you see it's not the enemy coming to kill you, no. It's one of Jennifer's friends already dead or being killed. It sends a message that you're next. There is no ambiguity there. You're next. And you can't really fight him. Yeah, you can struggle a bit and push him away if you have enough uh, stress level health thing. But that's just a small temporary reprieve. You need to run. And you can't run forever. You need to hide. But you can't hide forever. But especially hide. Hide is a problem. This is his house. You're just visiting. You have no idea where anything is. This is someone that's been living here their entire lives. This is someone that's been crawling through each and every corridor, each and every nook and cranny, 
learning, knowing exactly where everything is and able to get to any place they want by any means they wish. You are in the enemy's domain, meaning that behind every door can be your doom, your death. Anytime you think to yourself, oh, I've managed to hide somewhere safe, you realize, oh, no, 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 I'm just trapped here now. And there he comes with the scissors and the killing. In its construction and the mood it sets through its atmosphere of pretty much lack of music, lack of sound, apart from the and through the uh, the way the, that the house is built and how the enemy can navigate through it it is one of the best horror games ever made I'm sure the enemy isn't uh, ai driven it's not like the alien in uh, alien isolation what will happen is kind of scripted but it does vary depending on what order you do things different situations will happen in different rooms you may not get attacked in some, you may get attacked there if you return there at another time. And it also depends on uh, what ending you're going for. This is an adventure game. It's an adventure game to and through because you do have puzzles, a lot of them. And depending on how well you do with the puzzles, you may have different endings to the game. Let's say, for example, if you decide to uh, feed yourself to some madman lock in a cage, you're going to die and that's an ending. But you do also have other options. For example, you can find a car with some keys next to it and you can use that car to just drive off and abandon the friends that may or may not still be alive and you'll get home maybe you'll get home maybe you'll live to see tomorrow or maybe there's somebody hiding in the car with you with giant scissors waiting to kill you these are some possible endings depending on how many deaths you've witnessed and how much of a coward you are if you're willing to stay the course and do your best you do have a lot of endings that are a bit more positive where you don't necessarily die but getting to the true ending does take a lot of work a lot of figuring out uh, puzzles that may be a tad bit obscure there is some fatalness in the you have any hunt downs all sorts of objects that you have no idea what they're used for like ham or something but much like any adventure game you, you just know that if something is not bolted down you should pick it up actually know that that will lead to your doom because some things that you do pick up will absolutely murder you again going back to the parrot do not let the parrot out of the cage it will it will kill you do i think no wait uh, the, you're gonna need some birds at some point in the game but i don't think it was the parrot the game sort of screams for you to play it with z snes emulated so that you can have save states so you you'll know exactly if you can pick up something or not because otherwise you're just gonna restart it it's um i'm not sure if it's one of those games that has a safe feature i don't believe it has a safe feature you're just kind of gonna have to uh try it you're gonna have to play it learn it then die then learn some more then die as you got farther ahead and repeat it's sort of like um, the horror version of Get Good, if you will, or uh, that uh, movie with Tom Cruise where he goes back in time. But the thing is, un unlike the uh, cheapness that can be sometimes associated with the way you can die in Dark Souls, the cheapness in this game feels a bit more validated. Because as I said, you're in the enemy's turf. Everything here was designed to kill somebody. It's the home of a serial killer. It's not an inviting, pleasant place to be in. Also, uh, well, the, yeah, the, the main enemy may break the laws of physics and the way he vanishes from some places and appears in others, but yeah, there's not a lot of violations of the laws of physics in the sense that enemies will not hit through walls. You don't really have a bounding box. So it's, it's a bit fairer than if this were an action game is what i'm saying but the puzzles can sometimes be a bit tiny bit obscure also think there was a cat in a box that would kill you clock tower is very effective at what it tries to do it's selling the concept of helplessness of loneliness of despair it does it as best as any game can do i would say and the fact that it's hard to play uh, if you're gonna use the uh, snes version since it actually has an official translation to english i believe it kind of adds to the charm of it maybe perhaps the thing is that the windows version isn't necessarily better or quicker to play or easier to play because of the direct mouse control since all the movement is still the same 
same. You, you'll you still click on something and Jennifer will go and do the movement and you won't be able to cancel out of it and it still behaves like the same kind of game. And I would say that also the SNES version is probably easier to run than the Windows one, but actually no, the, uh, the Windows version that you'll find on the web, I, I think it may have been patched by the community, like works flawlessly. There's no option to get it to run on a bigger resolution than what you're seeing, or what you be, would be seeing on the background if I were not to have upscaled it a bit. And there's no save option to speak of, it's just the option to start quicker by skipping the intro. Which is a good feature to have, but it, it runs with no problem on Windows 10 on modern hardware. I'm sure it was like a really cheap and dirty port, but it was an effective one. Then again, if you're gonna run the SNES version, emulation will give you plenty of options to tinker and do what it as you would please. Regardless of what version of the game you may stumble upon, I wholeheartedly suggest that you try Clock Tower. As I've said, I have not finished it yet. I don't think I ever will, it's simply a bit too spooky for me. I dare say there are a few other spookier games, maybe Lone Survivor, that one was weird as well. It's a finely crafted horror game, and it's finely crafted with resources that are nothing compared to what we have today. It's a 2D game where you explore 3D space, it's planned out in 3D I mean, and it uses simple, I think some of them are rotoscope movements, doesn't go for full realism, but it goes for style it goes for mood, for atmosphere, for tension, and it pulls it off without a hitch. Yeah, some puzzles may be a bit kooky, but that's how the ball rolls. I've never played any of the sequels, so I have no idea if uh, the series went on to greatness or not. But I think it did, because it's like two or three sequels after it. Also, there was a project to remake it, but I don't think that went anywhere. Not sure if you can buy the games anymore. Uh, well, you can probably find the SNES cartridge on eBay or something. Probably sold by somebody that's trying to charge an arm and leg for it. But then again, you also have the internet, so do as you please. This has been the Spooktober Fest run things or stuff next week we'll come back to more regular non-horror based shows since we're gonna move to the 90 shooter craze or to the doom clone page and doom clone vember or something I don't know. i'll probably come up with a stupid name for it but it's gonna be those kinds of games goodbye